All right, we're going to move directly into our second panel, and uh, I'm sure people are getting food or, or, and will be uh, filtering back in here. Uh, well, Mary is obviously a tough act to follow, but we have a wonderful uh, panel to discuss uh, some more issues relating to uh, what happened in the Brown administration and what we can expect going forward. Uh, we're going to pivot a little from the a direct discussion about climate change and greenhouse gas emissions, and there, there, you know, there was some talk of that in, in Mary's talk, and there will be more of that later, um, and really talk about implementing some of the, uh, the key policies that we have going forward. Uh, we have a fabulous panel, so uh, I'm not, because we're running a little bit behind I don't want to take a lot of time with introductions since you have everyone's bio, but very briefly I'll just uh, introduce the panelists with their roles in the government now and in the prior administration. One of the things uh, that all these panelists have in common is that they have, they've worked both uh, in the state government during the Brown administration and now again or still uh, under the Newsom administration. Uh, so immediately to my left, I have Leanne Randolph, who is a graduate of the UCLA Law School, so exciting to have an alum uh, back here, uh, who was Deputy Secretary and General Counsel of the California Natural Resources Agency, appointed by Governor Brown, and is now a commissioner at the California Public Utilities Commission, appointed by Governor Brown, uh, I guess about four years ago, four and a half years, four and a half years ago, and, and continuing into the current administration. And as you'll hear about, uh, the PUC is at the front lines of some of the most challenging issues uh, in addressing the energy side of greenhouse gas emissions and also some of the, the impacts of climate change. Uh, then we have Joaquin Esquivel, who is the chair of the State Water uh, Resources Control Board. He was also appointed by Governor Brown and is still in the, uh, in the, uh, the role in this administration and was elevated to chair of the Water Board by Governor Newsom. Uh, he uh, served before that as assistant, assistant secretary for federal water policy at the Natural Resources Agency, uh, interfacing with the federal government on California's priorities. Um, and then we have Yana Garcia, who's Assistant Secretary for Environmental Justice and Tribal Affairs at Cal EPA, and was appointed uh, to that role by Governor Brown and is, is staying in that role un under the current governor. So uh, these panelists have a great ability to reflect um, and to, to think about what's going on now and what's going to happen going forward. Um, so uh, really our, our state's work on climate change and, uh, and on air quality issues and many other environmental issues, as you heard from, from Mary Nichols, has been going on for decades. Uh, the work, during Governor Schwarzenegger's administration, uh, the work on climate change itself was accelerated because our legislature passed AB 32, uh, our landmark climate change legislation, which, as Mary said, delegated a tremendous amount of authority to what she called unelected bureaucrats uh, to address climate change. Uh, and uh, I, I believe we actually have here today Fran Pavley in our audience somewhere. Uh, and Fran was, uh, so I don't, I don't want to give short shrift to the legislative role in all this. Uh, yeah, Fran was uh, not only the author of AB, of AB 32, or one of the co-authors of AB 32, and really shepherded it through the legislative process, but also authored AB 1493, which was the very first climate change bill addressing greenhouse gas emissions from automobile tailpipes, setting up in some ways the, uh, the fight with the Trump administration that's going on r right now, uh, because all of California's work on that, uh, on that issue really began with the passage of, of AB 1493. Um, so it, Climate change obviously affects the state in many ways, and most, most, in the most pressing way, it requires a transformation in our energy sector. And so not only does the Air Resources Board work on these issues, but, uh, but the California Public Utilities Commission has a really major role as the regulator of all the investor-owned utilities in the state uh, in trying to facilitate that energy transition. And as we'll hear, also has a role relating to climate impact because utilities are uh, responsible for some of the wildfires that we've seen in the state and their maintenance of their equipment uh, is, is a, a key factor. Um, we also see climate impacts on water supply, uh, and we're going to be talking about the future of water and, and how uh, we've addressed water recently. And of course, we have ongoing water quality issues as well, not just water supply issues. Uh, we'll hear about that. 
We also have, of course, a lot of issues involving still air quality, and many of those uh, affect frontline communities. And so there is uh, an environmental justice aspect to uh, a lot of the work we're do doing at the state level. And uh, I think from what I've seen, we can expect Governor Newsom to have a renewed focus on some of those environmental justice issues, in fact, affecting uh, communities of color and low-income communities throughout the state, uh, both air with respect to air quality and toxics. So um, I'm looking forward to a great panel about this. And uh, so the format of the panel will be, I'm gonna start with an introductory question for each of the panelists. Uh, we'll, uh, we'll talk about some of the key issues that each of them have worked on and are working on, and then we'll make it a more conversational panel and have some time for audience questions uh, towards the end. So I'm gonna start with a question uh, for, for Leanne. So uh, the, the Public Utility Commission has, the, has regulatory authority over investor-owned utilities utilities, and that, as I mentioned, is going to affect the integration of renewables and storage as we transition to less fo uh, fossil fuel use. The legislature also has given the Public Utilities Commission a key role in addressing utilities con contributions to wildfire risk, and I understand just this week uh, there, the commission made an important decision about uh, uh, guidelines for addressing that, that risk going forward. Uh, can you give us a sense of how you see your role both in, in, in both of those senses in helping California transition? to clean energy and also in addressing climate change related risks and how that role has changed in the four years that you've been on the commission. Sure. Um, excited to be back in the room where I learned civil procedure along with uh, Abraham Lincoln up there. Um, super excited to be talking about something more engaging than civil procedure. Um, so, you know, as you know, in due in large part to um, my predecessors on the Public Utilities Commission, California um, is now a leader in terms of the amount of um, utility scale renewables and rooftop solar that we have um, in our state. And, um, and so in the Brown administration, the, you know, with the renewable portfolio standards, we were very focused on um, achieving a certain percentage of renewable energy. Um, the Public Utilities Commission required the IOUs to go out and acquire resources um, that at the time um, were more expensive than um, the uh, emitting resources and really, you know, set the state on a path um, to achieve its 2020 goals early um, and to have a high percentage of zero carbon resources. Uh, during the, the last administration, that focus shifted a little bit um, with the passage of SB 350. Um, and instead of just looking for percentages of renewables, um, the legislature mandated that we look at what the greenhouse gas um, emissions were um, required the ARB to set targets and for us to uh, work with them to set targets for um, the electricity sector to not just increase the penetration of renewables on the system but actually plan for lower carbon resources and so that was um, a uh, large part of the focus of the PUC over the last few years was uh, implementing the integrated resources planning process and creating portfolios that um, uh, drive down the um, greenhouse gas emissions in California, um, going to that 40% reduction by 2030 target that Kara mentioned earlier. Um, then that has, that we continue to work on that, working very hard on that. Um, but that has shifted over time with the passage of SB 100 and really looking at the, uh, the goals that Mary mentioned in terms of trying to get to um, zero net carbon and really trying to figure out how to decarbonize um, the uh, energy sector along with all of the other sectors. Um, and you know, as most of you probably know, the energy sector is only about 20%. Um, over overall greenhouse gas emissions in the state. Um, but it's a sector we have a little more control over. So we've been able to achieve a lot of success and, um, and we continue to work on that um, success. But with it brings uh, a fair amount of challenges. Um, as I'm sure a lot of you have, have sort of heard issues about integration of renewables, how challenging it is to 
uh, integrate renewables into the system and make sure you're covering, you're having adequate reliability for all of the 8,760 hours of a given year. Um, are you having uh, reliability in bad weather? Are you having reliability in the evening when um, the uh, effectiveness of solar is going down? but people are going home and turning on their appliances and your load is increasing, and how do you address that? Right now, we address that with uh, emitting resources, and a major uh, focus of our work is trying to get to the place where we are not having to rely on emitting resources to, to do that. Um, and uh, I don't know how many of you saw an article a few days ago um, that uh, Sammy Roth wrote in the LA Times about um, how it's actually cheaper to kind of overbuild solar and then, and then curtail that solar in the middle of the day or export it someplace else. Um, and that's largely consistent with the modeling that we've done um, is that you know, for a, uh, a certain percentage of curtailment is actually cheaper than uh, trying to figure out how to bring um, sort of new resources onto the system. However, at some point, it gets to be too much. And so we really need to be thinking about, can we develop both short duration and long duration energy storage? Can we uh, import wind from other states? Um, in the Brown administration, um, we were very focused on opportunities to bring in resources from other states um, and integrate the grid in a way that we could take advantage of wind in, in uh, other states and, and, uh, and export our solar to them. And so those are still issues that we are thinking about. Um, but as Sean mentioned, overlaid on top of that is um, the effects of climate change. We were working hard on mitigating as best we could, um, and now we're hit with, with actually having to uh, deal with the impacts. And um, so a, a major focus of ours is dealing with wildfire risk. Uh, only about 10% of wildfires are caused by um, uh, electrical equipment, but that 10% um, tends to be the most destructive because it's usually high winds that cause the impact on the equipment, and then high winds make the fire move faster and, um, and be more destructive and create the firestorms that we're seeing. So um, one of the, the things that keeps me up at night is one of, we were able to take the opportunity to go out and find new resources, go out and, and create a solar market. Um, and now we want to create you know, a market for, um, for energy storage. But now we also have to, at the same time, harden our electric infrastructure, um, things like covered conductors and increased vegetation management and all of the different ways that we have to address wildfire risk is going to create um, some serious cost pressures for us. Um, and so really trying to figure out ways to balance the, um, the need to uh, deal with both the effects of climate change while continuing on our path to uh, create new, new opportunities to mitigate climate change is going to be uh, a heavy lift in the coming years. Thank you. Um, so we'll, uh, we'll follow up and talk a little bit more about each of those, those issues. Uh, but now I have a question for you, Joaquin. Um, so we know climate change is one of many stressors on uh, the state's water supply. Uh, there have been some really positive developments in water planning, including the legislature's enactment of SIGMA, the Groundwater Management Act, uh, uh, five years ago. Uh, we have, we're the last remaining state with no formal mechanism for regulating groundwater use, I think. And so, uh, you know, many people are surprised by that, but it really, uh, you know, we're, we have to be brought into the, you know, into the, the you know, the, uh, the, the current world with our water management. Um, at the same time, there's some challenges. There's a re increased recognition of instability of drinking water supply and quality. Uh, Governor Brown's efforts to pass the Twin Tunnels Delta Water Fix project was very controversial and, of course, didn't succeed. And so then the question is, what do we do about some of the challenges that we're facing in the Delta? And here in Southern California, we know that over-reliance on Delta and Colorado River imports is not going to be a successful strategy. 
Uh, Governor Newsom recently called for a state portfolio of water resilience actions through an executive order, and a lot of us were, uh, were really in intrigued by that and heartened to see the focus on it, but aren't sure exactly what it means. So uh, we'd love to, for you to talk about a little, bit, uh, a little bit about what this means and what you see as some of the key issues confronting the state going forward with water management. Thank you, Sean, and thank you all for the opportunity to participate in today's discussion. Um, I found the opening remarks uh, very, very refreshing, obviously, already. And, um, you know, when we talk about water, uh, Kara had touched on some of the ways that California has really been a leader in uh, the environmental space, and it includes water, uh, sigma notwithstanding, which is really kind of emblematic, I think, of some of the challenges uh, in water management is that there are examples where California has really led and others where we've obviously had some very difficult conversations that we have not been able to have amongst us because of maybe the emotionality of water sometimes or really just the, the struggles around it. But going to where we've been uh, leaders, you know, you look at the history of the State Water Resources Control Board um, and Porter Cologne, and which was passed prior to the Clean Water Act and was actually a model for the Clean Water Act in many ways. Um, but it, as an example of that sort of leadership, and certainly uh, at the state board where we, you know, we not only have administration over water rights in the state and water quality, but since 2014 now have the division of drinking water over at the State Water Sources Control Board, which, you know, for me, I, I argue, makes us one of the first you know, really modern regulatory entities when we talk about how other states manage uh, water in the nation. Uh, the state board is incredibly unique to have both drinking water, water rights, and water quality. So being able to try to protect uh, the headwaters and the water quality as it, and, and water quality from, from the start of our system uh, in the Sierra Nevada as, as water makes its way through our rivers onto ag land, back off, into, into cities, into uh, our, our taps for drinking water, out our toilets, and back into that same system. And you know, when we talk about the challenges we face around water, and, and I will get to the executive order here in a moment, but um, you know, in, in this, in this ties directly uh, into it, um, it. We're a little, it's, it's different. You know, the challenges are certainly within the same context. It's, it's climate change, it's aging infrastructure, it's, it's a number of issues, but unlike, say, in the, in the um, electricity sector or other sectors that we're also making headway on these issues, um, it's incredibly dispersed. Uh, we have over 7,000 um, agencies that provide drinking water in, in to Californians throughout this uh, state. You look at the ele electricity sector and you have far fewer players. So when we talk about the sort of dis the scope of distributed actions that really impact and uh, our ability to, to manage these challenges and, and our ability to manage water resources generally, um, I really feel we're, we're, we're kind of at the tip of, of what, is, it, what is possible there. Um, and so uh, in, in California, you know, thankfully we have had, had and continue to have incredible leadership. Um, you, know, you look at the State Water Resources Control Board and certainly the, the board that Felicia Marcus had inherited in 2013 is uh, not the, the board that I have the, um, the honor of inheriting in 2019, and it was because of a tremendous amount of leadership on her part, but also on the part of many that are actually sitting here in this room who um, you know, really saw water as I, a frontline issue when it comes to climate change. And I know greenhouse gas reduction um, you know, advances in, in, in uh, the electricity sector, electric sector, or transportation generally, are, are pretty important, but uh, when you talk about water and our ability to move it, uh, what, what it means to us as Californians, um, it's incredibly ingrained in our, um, our, our ethos and, and who we are. Um, you know, Mary, Mary talked about that being a, a key component to some of the successes as to why California seems to be able to, to kind of think differently about things and maybe act a little differently and, and uh, lead in, in so many of these spaces. And it, it is because Californians are so tied to their landscape. You know, we see ourselves in our state, you know, the shape of it, the divisions amongst it, the variety in its geography, and for me, the variety in its hydrology, where we have a, a very wet north, a drier south, uh, a, an incredible resource in the Sierra Nevada, and, and, and we've, we've plumbed this system and connected ourselves to one another 
and it's part of our, our, our identity. And so, um, you know, that all to say that, again, uh, when it comes to then water management, uh, we, we, we find ourselves with a lot of uh, similarities from uh, these discussions that we've had uh, around climate change and greenhouse gas reduction and, and how we diversify our, our sectors to really accommodate uh, these big goals. And, and water is this, you know, this next sort of forefront. And if you look at the last administration and the California Water Action Plan, it was a, an incredible document. And so far as getting the California Department of Food and Agriculture, getting California mm -hmm. Environment and Protect, uh, Environmental Protection Agency, Cal EPA, and getting the Natural Resources Agency to come together on a common document because, again, water management is so dispersed amongst us, even you know, with the state board being this, as I say, a, 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 a modern regulatory agency with drinking water and all these components, we still are uh, obviously incredibly dependent upon our sister agencies at the Department of uh, Fish and Wildlife, at the Department of Water Resources, at uh, Food and Agriculture as well, given the, the incredible uh, relationship that, and importance that agriculture has in the management of these landscape level uh, challenges that we have, and, and water obviously being um, one that comes to mind. Um, and so in the Brown administration, we had the California Water Action Plan that brought us together. It had for the first time, you know, spelled out these general things that really were a synthesis of yet again that leadership that California has demonstrated and how we're going to adapt. We are going to adapt to climate change and what do we have done. And that includes recycling more of our water, uh, integrating our surface and groundwater usage, identifying key and sensitive ecosystems that we need to better manage and account for uh, the needs of you know, the ecology that we find, which um, in, in uh, the fashion that only uh, Governor Brown can, I uh, recall um, him once going into, of course, the, the, the Greek uh, uh, root meanings of ecology and economy Ecos and their their core share that they, they refer to the house, but ecology is an explain, explanation of the house as as it is, and the economy is how you manage that house and is inherently a subset of the ecology. So the economy is a subset of the ecology and not the other way around. So we find that we have natural limits to what it is that we do, but arguments and Mary knows these well that you can't do certain things because if you do, it will impact that economy. But it, it, is, it, it is unfortunately a, a, a false dichotomy because they, we can talk about it in a way that you don't have to, and California has demonstrated this, you don't have to hurt the economy in order to care for the ecology that we find. And so um, the California Water Action Plan was a, a list of, of good ideas, uh, ultimately. It was, you know, what are, what are the things that we should be doing to respond to climate change? What, what do we need to do further? But unfortunately, um, you know, candidly, didn't really have metrics because it kind of, unlike, say, uh, in climate change and, or in greenhouse gas reduction or other targets that we set for ourselves, um, there's a power in that. And we saw that during the drought and conservation. You know, set, set, a, set a target and people, Californians, will, will, will meet it. But you have to measure it and you have to set it in order to be able to, to move toward it. And the California Water Action Plan was less so. So when we talk about the water portfolio, when we talk about the executive order that Governor Newsom um, uh, has directed us, which, you know, to have certainly an administration that was not shy about some very large and ambitious goals around water management in California, to then now be you know, blessed with an administration that is now doubling down on wanting to, con you know, uh, uh, conti to continue uh, water as such a, a key part of um, their goals and, and the, 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 the brain trust space, if you will, around how we are really gonna adapt to climate change and how we're gonna allow this incredible you know, gift that we have, this place where 40 million people are part of the fifth largest economy world, how are we going to ensure that our water systems are going to carry us into 2050? You know, the, 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 the time span horizon for me sometimes is that next 30 years, uh, what, what do we need to do on the water sector side to really uh, advance uh, in big ways this discussion? Because we've seen with this last drought and now with floods and, and the continued challenges around our management of the resources, it's only going to get uh, harder. So the executive order and this water portfolio uh, approach, it is first actually a listening session, a better synthesizing, again, of what I think are examples of a tremendous amount of leadership throughout the state around, around water management, and then saying, 
how do we put it into some better metric, some better way of measuring what is water, what is local resiliency and water supply look like? The hard part is it looks different everywhere in the state. You know, the Coachella Valley water management looks very different down in the Coachella Valley than it does up in the Salinas Valley or up near the Klamath or down in San Diego. And so the, the challenge will be in this exercise that um, we'll, there will actually be a, a, um, a release here within the next few days, we hope, of um, that first invitation for the public to begin to engage with us around what are your ideas? Envision your communities in 2050 mm -hmm. and, and say, what, what does water management look like for our community? What does uh, water resiliency look like for our community? And, and we're gonna try to stitch that together into a better framework, into a better metric that um, one, you know, certainly uh, there's a tremendous amount of work that we need to be doing interagency wise and it'll be a, a framework by which we can speak to how we're trying to excel and meet these external targets and goals around water resiliency and water management um, internally. But uh, importantly, um, you know, how do we again have some common metrics and frameworks? Well, you know, we talk about reducing dependency on the Delta and uh, what, but how do we better even measure that? We know there are local uh, projects going in to better uh, manage groundwater or have water recycling projects that take that pressure off um, that, that export that you know, we know that we need to build a greater certainty around but need to stop continuing to depend upon it. We need these local supplies. But how do we better track our progress toward uh, meeting these resiliency challenges we know we had to uh, face? So hopefully that was a helpful, yeah. uh, quick download, and, and I look forward to further discussion around it. That was, uh, that was great. So, so Yana, uh, your work um, in both the Brown and Newsom administrations is focused on equity, justice, and resilience across many aspects of environmental policy. Uh, over the past decade, there's been a lot increased advocacy and increased recognition by state agencies of these uh, disproportionate harms to low-income communities and communities of color. Can you provide uh, some examples of some key issues you're working on right now and how those either have changed or are continuing between the Brown administration and the Newsom administration and, and what we can expect on that front? Sure. Sure, and likewise, thank you for having me here. It's a real honor and pleasure to be down here with all of you. Um, so I have a, a few, about three sort of topic areas that I'll categorize these comments into. The first um, is some of the consistency and change in our perspective with respect to how we're looking at equity um, from an implementation standpoint, how we are prioritizing our investments, how we're of both funding and also programmatic investment, um, and then move into a bit of how some subject matter areas have really come into the fold of how we're thinking about climate change impacts, specifically around pesticide issues, um, oil and gas supply side issues, and drinking water. Um, and then finally, just want to end on a couple challenges that I think are still ahead. Um, so first, with respect to our framework for how we understand equity, I think under the Brown administration, we saw a lot of progress towards identifying uh, disproportionately burdened communities through tools like Cal Screen that really look at health and pollution burdens, um, but are specifically focused on environmental burdens. Um, and I think that the genesis and um, shift in each iteration of, of Cal Enviroscreen has, as a tool has done a lot uh, to really bring equity to the forefront um, of people's thinking. Of course, SB 535 and the requirement to target our funding has done the same. Um, so we've seen a lot of really great progress over the past years um, in, in agencies really having to take a hard look at how we're prioritizing our investments in communities that need it most. Um, what I think is ahead of us now in terms of, of taking maybe a slightly different approach than what we've taken in the past is recognizing um, that environmental burdens are not everything. Um, we have a lot of socioeconomic and health vulnerabilities that um, also deserve our attention and that may not be captured in the same geographic way as environmental burdens are. Um, we're also facing increasingly mobile challenges uh, such as displacement 
um, which affect a lot of historically disproportionately burdened communities from an environmental standpoint, but really can't be captured by a tool that looks geographically. Um, I think the Cal Enviro Screen tool has been so critical and important, um, and I'm really excited to be able to, to look at ways in which we can continue to improve it um, through each iteration. Um, with respect to tribes, we also know that there are ways in which our tribal communities across our state um, are not adequately captured from a data standpoint. Um, when we're thinking about resilience and adaptation planning, there are still a lot of gaps when it comes to thinking about how our tribes are not only uh, communities and sovereign nations in many instances that deserve particular attention, but that also can be resources to inform much of our planning processes. I think the emergence of traditional ecological knowledge in our framing is really critical and important, and I'm also excited to kind of move forward um, in a way that invites that type of input. Um, on some of the topical areas, I think, um, some of what we've seen in the recent past um, that is somewhat distinct from um, what was, I think, at the forefront under the Brown administration, but certainly builds upon many years of work um, that was done under the Brown administration at Cal EPA is the first cancellation of a pesticide registration. Um, we're looking at a new action with respect to a um, pretty harmful neurodevelopmental toxicant, um, chlorpyrifos, which affects farm worker communities, uh, affects farm worker families, affects many of our rural communities across our state. Um, we're looking at ways in which not only to uh, control the use of harmful pesticide products such as chlorpyrifos, but also to really think strategically about alternatives. Um, less harmful alternatives, alternatives that really help us progress toward more sustainable agricultural production. Um, and I think that that's really opening up a conversation that's been much needed and that really gives us an opportunity to elevate some of the voices of our rural communities, not only our farm workers and farm worker families, but also some of the um, small scale farmers um, that have been doing some sustainable, engaging in sustainable agricultural practices that can be brought to scale. And um, so that's another exciting area. Um, with respect to drinking water, Joaquin mentioned um, you know, the, the portfolio of, of water actions and also the need for metrics and ways that we can develop um, measurements of progress, ways in which we can evaluate our success or lack thereof with respect to delivering on a number of water issues. Um, what we've been thinking about, and this is work, um, as much of what I do is, uh, of course, building on much of the work that my predecessor did, who's in the room, Arsenio, um, is really looking at the human right to water holistically and breaking down its components into um, topical areas that we can assess much in the way that we've looked at um, the cumulative burdens that we capture in Cal Screen. So looking at each component that comprises the human right to water, looking at water quality, water affordability, access, um, and thinking about how we can identify what areas across our state, what water systems might be in need of particular attention and how we can evaluate how our programs are either meeting the needs that those systems and those systems users have or are not. Um, I think that this area of work has, has also long been coming um, and is reflective of a lot of many years of time and attention um, and is hopefully going to be a, a really important linchpin to much of what's to come ahead. Um, whether that's implementing uh, new funding, um, which we hope it can be used to prioritize funding, but also to understand what the needs are, not just on a statewide level, but at the local level. Finally, with respect to um, some of our climate portfolio um, of actions, you know, Mary talked a lot about the history of what makes California so exceptional with respect to our climate policy. Um, and we've done a really admirable job of addressing um, many, climate, many of our climate impacts. Um, if, for those of you who have seen the uh, governor's budget, um, there is a 
um, really hopeful one sentence um, about a uh, study that will actually look at the supply side needs, um, the supply side of fossil fuels um, across our state and gives us an opportunity to think about how we want to address the eventual um, uh, downturn in a potential um, area that's been really critical to many environmental justice stakeholders and advocates across our state. We know that at the local level, um, many controls, pollution controls, including here in the city of LA, um, cause disproportionate burdens to communities of color and low-income communities across our state. Um, this is the case in Kern, it's the case in Los Angeles. Um, and so really thinking about how we can both look at the supply side issues with respect to fossil fuels from a climate standpoint, but also from a health and safety standpoint and really focus our attention on criteria pollutants and air toxics um, is also a really big area of opportunity um, that lies ahead. Um, the challenges that I think we've kind of continued forward um, are first, uh, working in partnership with our local regulatory partners. Um, I think there's only so much we can do at the state level. Um, we see consistently, particularly in the environmental justice space, um, continuing inequities across our state that vary geographically and really depend on the relative political power of um, a particular community with respect to their local agencies as well and local representatives. Um, this is an area that I think we need to really continue to focus on, um, think about how we can work in partnership um, in a stronger partnership with our local regulatory agencies across the state um, to address some of these longstanding issues. Um, some of the, our programs that we're continuing to implement from the last administration into this one, including the Transformative Climate Communities Program and the implementation of Assembly Bill uh, 617, which requires localized air pollution reductions, give us the opportunity to do this um, in partnership with city governments, with county governments, as well as with um, air districts and the like. Um, so these are areas that have continued work um, and will also be opportunities to sort of develop metrics um, to, chart, to chart out and define our progress or lack thereof. Um, finally, I think we have um, a real opportunity and I, I wanna take the opportunity to, to really mention this in this space in particular um, at the law school um, to continue to diversify our representation in some of these um, non-appointed bureaucratic positions um, and in the environmental legal field. Um, I've worked in both the environmental nonprofit sector and now at the state, um, and we still need diversity and perspective. Uh, we are lacking. Um, and so I think thinking through opportunities to not only um, identify vulnerable communities, identify some of the communities that we're trying to support and uplift, but also really provide opportunities to bring in leadership um, from those communities and to um, give space for new leadership to develop is also really important. Thank you very much. I, I really appreciate those comments. And, uh, and I guess I'll, I'll give a plug for law students and young lawyers in the room. Also, Arsenio Mataka, is, who was Yana's predecessor at Cali PA, is here. And uh, the Attorney General runs an honors program and also has been doing a lot of hiring recently. Uh, <laughs> uh, and, uh, and so, uh, you know, that's an area where there's a particular amount of opportunity. But I, I've seen, I mean, w one of the really remarkable things about the last few months has been the way wave of hiring of really high quality people in high quality positions at, from uh, the entry level all the way up to the top uh, w w you know, within environmental law and policy. And uh, it's been heartening to see that, uh, that the, the state is willing to devote more resources uh, to that. So one of the things that's been uh, really interesting to me with a panel of folks uh, who have you know, high level positions in government is the, the focus on 
developing metrics and measuring and assessing. And I guess I, there's a couple I, things for, for me that come from that. I mean, first of all, I think that's fabulous because it's something that we need. Secondly, it's kind of remarkable that we don't already have the metrics and the measurements that we need to assess everything. And I could also imagine someone saying, well, it's fine to develop the metrics and assess, but then like you have to do something with all of that. And so what is the path to that? And so um, I'm curious from each of your perspectives um, how that road looks. What you know, what you see are the gaps in, in metrics, kind of generally, and how you see the road from uh, measuring things to actually taking taking action in, in the world that you're that you're working in. I don't know if, if, if any of you want to want to start with that, but I, it, it seemed like a, something that really jumped out at me from all three of you is that that focus. Yeah, we've spent a lot of time thinking about that um, at the Public Utilities Commission in. A lot of different ways, and you know, the wildfire example is probably um, the thing that first comes to mind. Um, the uh, legislature codified what we had had um, uh, required uh, two years ago uh, in terms of uh, requiring the IOUs to submit wildfire mitigation plans. So um, that requirement was codified and, and the legislature thoughtfully gave us six months to review these incredibly <laughs> complex wildfire mitigation plans. And um, one of the big conversations when we adopted them at our um, last commission meeting was how, what, you know, how do you measure success? Do you measure success based on the number of trees you cut down or do you measure the success based on you stopped, you know, prevented actual wildfires? And so trying to figure out how do we create met metrics that get to preventing actual wildfires um, is, is um, harder than it, it sounds. Um, and, uh, and similarly with uh, sort of our planning processes, trying to uh, chart the path to 2045, you know, looking at what procurement the utilities and other load serving entities like CCAs need to be doing to get us to that ultimate path because there's a lot of interim years and are we, are we going in the right direction and, you know, we don't want to wake up in, um, you know, 2031 and go, oh my gosh, you know, we haven't, you know, we're, we're way behind, we haven't, we haven't accomplished enough. Um, so trying to develop those metrics has been um, particularly challenging for us, but we are spending a lot of time working on it and we'll hopefully have um, some success at it. And, and congratulations in getting that guidance out uh, on, on the schedule. Uh, I'm sure it was a difficult lift to do that. Yeah, I have to put in a plug for Sean's sister who is an administrative law <laughs> judge at the Public Utilities Commission and was one of the uh, management team that shepherded those plans and it was, it was an incredible accomplishment. Thanks. Um, so curious if either of you have, uh, have comments on that same question about metrics into action. Yeah, I'm, so um, interesting point. Actually, this is the first year California's water rights holders have all reported their previous year's uh, water withdrawals. First year. This is the first year we've done that. It's kind of a little sad. But, um, <laughs> You know, it's, it, it, it's it, because of the artifact of, you know, having pre-1914 water rights holders uh, that predate even uh, California's uh, water rights system, et cetera. We had some reporters that were reporting once every three or five years. Uh, water users are reporting once every three or five years. So when we talk about water data and data generally and metrics and uh, in, in California water, we, we actually have uh, actually that point notwithstanding, we do have a tremendous amount of data in, in water. Uh, you know, the state board as a regulatory entity collects tremendous amounts of data. And uh, whether it's, um, you know, as part of MPDS, you know, National Pollutant Discharge Elimination System uh, permits and monitoring requirements, whether it's the yearly electronic report, the drinking water agencies send to us, whether it's you know, it's we we are a very uh, data rich um, agency. I think the 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 problem is you can have a lot of data, but um, is it information? And there's a difference there in there. And that key, that trick, is ensuring that your data is providing information that feeds back into then ultimately, hopefully, better policy management decisions, et cetera. 
Um, and so I think in when we talk about water, when we talk about you know continuing to create metrics to be able to drive, you know what for me uh, I, I think the ultimate goal is to better create common decision support tools that allow because of the you know the disparate nature of water management, which isn't going to go anywhere anywhere anytime soon, especially with Sigma, which created you know. 500 uh, additional uh, um, water agencies in the state, in this case, groundwater agencies. But um, how do we, though, given the disparate nature, create information out of data, commonly understood data, and common then understandings of our watersheds so that you know, small actions that you know, water districts may take within their context in the watershed or other, other users of, of the resource um, are able to scale up into Again, what are then ostensibly larger uh, watershed-wide metrics, and um, the exciting part is, I think there's again examples of of where that's happening, and and particularly using then remote sensing around uh, data um, to maybe accomplish things at lower cost um, than it would take to make a bunch of people report something to you. So anyway. I, Thanks. Thank you. And so, Yana, you mentioned the Cal Enviro screen tool. You all can, can find that on the web. It's this, this really fascinating and sophisticated tool that, that looks at demographic information and pollution burdens on communities at the census tract level mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, you know, provides an incredible amount of data that's being used to, to channel money to the, you know, to, to the areas that need it most. But as you pointed out, um, that metric only looks at certain things and maybe doesn't work in certain contexts to actually flesh out all of the uh, all the data gaps that exist and all the places where there's need. So I'd love for you to talk a little bit more deeply about uh, about how you see data translating into action on sure. uh, in, in environmental justice. Sure. Um, I think some of the the broad strokes challenge in um, developing metrics to uh, measure our success in dealing with um, environmental injustices or remedying environmental injustices is sort of the inherent intersectional nature of many of these injustices. So it's like, what are you, what's, what's the issue that you're trying to solve? Um, and so for us at Cal EPA, it's kind of an easier question um, considering we can solve what we can control um, or attempt to do that. Um, so looking at um, things like particulate matter emissions, particularly diesel particulate matter emissions, um, and coupling those rates um, as they're reflected in Cal Screen with um, the addition of hopefully new data um, that we'll be getting through AB 617 implementation, for example, um, can give us some helpful reference points, I think, to, to look at maybe a target that we'd want to set for decreasing um, diesel particulate matter emissions in the top five scoring census tracks by, I don't know, 30% or something like that. Um, we can um, similarly look at um, drinking water issues and set similar targets. Um, we have not done so yet, um, but I think that there's a lot of potential there. I also think there's interesting examples being discussed actually at the local level through um, implementation of SB 1000, um, which is a law that requires local land use agencies to include an environmental justice element in their general plan when they're updating the climate element or um, updating two or more elements in that general plan. Um, and there, I think largely because it's an, an unfunded mandate and a pretty challenging <laughs> mandate, um, local land use agencies that are interested in, in really taking compliance seriously are thinking through how to develop a standard through which they're going to understand, like, what does an environmental justice element look like and how is it distinct from other general plan elements that we've looked at in the past. And so they're looking at various land use designations and how they might be able to change those. Um, they're looking at developing metrics with respect to community outreach and engagement <clears throat> and community input, um, which is also an interesting area to think through. You know, how, have, how can we evaluate whether we really heard the community in this instance, whether um, their input is really um, integrated into this ultimate plan. Um, I think that's a little you know, fuzzier and frankly, I think sometimes ends up being uh, simply reflected back to you based on what 
your community stakeholders give you in terms of feedback. Um, so that's a little different to measure, but they've also looked at um, decreasing asthma rates, so scaling down the Cal Enviro screen score. So you're not as interested, for example, in a city like LA in addressing all of the top 25% statewide census tracts in your city. You create a different scale. You look at all, the full city and you create your own top 25 or your own top 20, whatever it is. And then you set metrics based on that rescaling. Um, and I think that's been a very interesting area of conversation um, because so many of the issues that we deal with in the environmental justice context are inherently local land use decisions often. Um, not to say that they're not also state decisions. That's like one of my least favorite lines is that's a local land use issue. We have nothing to do with it. We have a lot to do with it. Um, but uh, I do think that there's, there's just an interesting opportunity there to think about how um, these statewide data sets can be used at the local level. Thank you, thank you. Um, so I, um, I want to open it up before too long for, uh, for questions from the folks who are, who are attending. But I do have one, uh, one follow-up I'm curious about. Each of you mentioned uh, legislation that really has been passed in the last several years as a key part of your mandate, right? The legislature has been very active in creating new mandates, both to, to collect and use data, uh, to take action in various ways, um, what do you do? You have any thoughts going forward on uh, what you see the legislative focus being, and how that might affect you? Are there tools that you need from the legislature that you would like to see? If you can talk about that, uh, are there things that are coming on the horizon, or do you feel like the set of tools that you have now um, is the right set of tools from the legislature to do what you want to do? Does tools include money? <laughs> <laughs> So um, sure, talk about the funding too. <laughs> now I will say um, uh, the PC has always had an interesting relationship with the legislature. Um, and you know, to some degree, sometimes I feel like they need to give us a little more breathing room. Um, I'll give you an example. Um, you know, we have under SB 350, um, and SB 100, you know, we are trying to create these um, portfolios of resources that drive down greenhouse gas emissions. Um, and we have a very complex modeling framework to look at um, how to build a portfolio that would be implemented by the IOUs, the CCAs, and the direct access uh, energy providers. Um, and it's v always very tempting for um, the legislature to say, well, I want you to buy this particular resource, or I want you to buy that particular resource, or you know, I want you to spend X amount of money on, on that uh, shiny new thing. Um, and so what you know, would be helpful for us is to sort of let that planning process continue to play out and let it be, um, uh, successful in building the portfolio that that um, um, sort of the analysis shows will provide us with the right um, GHG reduction, um, but also, um, you know, with an eye towards cost and with an eye towards reliability, because you know the challenging um, uh, lift in our sector is that that you know, real people pay these energy bills and we don't want to disproportionately impact um, uh, people in the state who, you know, get that feeling in the pit of their stomach when they open their summertime electricity bill. Um, so uh, sort of, you know, trying to, to uh, let us build that portfolio with an eye towards all of that goal, all those goals um, would be, very helpful. Thanks. We're very fortunate for an active legislature these last years, and it doesn't look like that's going to stop around around water and, and water policy issues. You know, I hope it, it obvious it, it it's obvious to state, but we we're challenged by being a fee based organization. Um, insofar as we, as I'm sure most of you know, 
go hat in hand to our regulated entities and say, pay us to, to regulate you. So we will, we will never be over-resourced. And it's a fun yearly conversation we get to have with them when we justify the fees for that year again and go over every hour as to why their program is burdening. Anyway, it is, it is, uh, it isn't, it isn't the most, um, uh, it's not the funnest conversation to have, but it is simply the way it is. Um, and so I'm always interested in how to get additional resources, dollars, uh, particularly around uh, our data systems. Uh, I was, I had the, the fortune to also be an IT director for Senator Boxer amongst my legislative portfolio when I worked for her in Washington, D.C. And so um, I, I bring some of that to me, uh, to my chairmanship, where I know that uh, the systems that we run on, the systems that we depend upon, are our regulatory platforms. And to the extent, I mean, the DMV comes to mind, and we're no DMV currently, but you know, I don't want to, our systems to come to that point. But you look at eRIMS, our water rights uh, database system, uh, you look at you know, uh, any of the 68 enterprise systems that the water boards uh, uses for all of its regulatory work, and there's a, a critical need there. And it's obvious it's hard. You know, I'm going to try to make the best case to those regulated entities that we should better account for what you know, the, the tech needs are, if you will, of us as an agency to really become a 21st century regulatory agency that maybe saves them money by allowing them to use uh, APIs to, you know, report their data to us as opposed to having a, a, a PY, a person, have to enter in manually all this data, things like that that, um, you know, I look forward to, to being able to do. So, yeah, you know, it, we, again, we've had a very um, active uh, relationship with the legislature on this issue, even when we talk about Senator Dodd and the Open Water uh, Data Act, uh, Transparency Act, um, which, you know, is fueling a lot of great work internally for us, but not too many dollars came with it. So, I um, appreciate it. Thanks. Yana? Um, I hesitate to, to <laughs> say, um, as Commissioner Randolph did, give us some time, but we, there's so much implementation <laughs> happening that sometimes it's like, hold on a second, just give us a little time to show you what we're doing. Um, I, I think the legislature has done really incredible things for um, the work that, that the um, Office of the Secretary does for our environmental justice work. Um, I think we could use some assistance in like clarifying the role of the GGRF honestly among the legislative kind of grab bag of, for, the, for those uh, who don't know can you the greenhouse gas reduction fund um, which is consistently a um, source of um, a lot of not just tension but sort of grabbing at various pots of, of <laughs> funding out of there um, among the legislature um, and I think that there's um, a lot of critique, frankly, that we get with respect to Cal Enviro Screen that I often think is more so placed on the GGRF um, and where those greenhouse gas reduction monies are allocated um, for which projects. Um, we get some pushback often um, on the Cal Enviro Screen tool that you know it's not a tool for every purpose, it's not a tool for every use, and I fully agree. Um, I also think the Greenhouse Gas Reduction Fund is not the funding source for every purpose and every use. Um, and so sometimes I think there's a need for some, some clarity there um, that the legislature could certainly help us with. Thank you. Um, so I'd love to open it up for questions. Um, I, I know folks may have a lot to, to ask. Um, I'll repeat the question uh, just because we're being recorded, and then uh, you're welcome to ask a question directed to the panel or to, to any particular member. Um, yes, Ray? Uh, thank you, Yana, for mentioning the uh, and their, their role in, in state I'd like to ask uh, Joaquin and Leanne, what work in your offices are doing with indigenous communities? And are you approaching them as business partners with sovereign entity, or just recognize them because they're there and you're, you feel an obligation to so, um, so the question uh, d directed to, um, to both Leanne and to Joaquin is what work their agencies are doing with and in collaboration with and for in, uh, indigenous communities uh, and tribes, and uh, do they view them as business partners and sovereign entities, or are they, uh, are they I mean, I guess I could paraphrase by say kind of going through the motions. <laughs> so we have, um, 
I guess I can identify a couple areas of engagement. Uh, typically, um, when we uh, engage with indigenous communities, it's in our um, CEQA process, usually around transmission um, and, um, and in some instances, renewable siting. Um, and uh, so we recently, about a year and a half, two years ago, adopted um, finally, our, uh, a formal consultation policy, and we appointed a tribal liaison who implements our AB 52 um, program and um, is you know, out working uh, in the community. Um, so that's number one. Number two is we recently, um, under the leadership of my fellow commissioner, Martha guzman um, we are working on a policy for um, uh, transferring properties that are held by the stewardship or were held by PG&E under the gu guidance of the stewardship council that arose out of the last bankruptcy. Um, and one of the challenges with that is trying to get as much of that land back to tribes as possible. Um, and what we have found over the years is that there are um, too many instances where either um, uh, tribes were not successful in obtaining um, land through the transaction or the company decided to retain uh, land and um, in instances where we felt, you know, there should have been more of an opportunity. So we are working on a basically a first right of refusal policy. Um, and so we just discussed the first draft and then we're going to be starting a series of um, meetings and consultations uh, throughout the state to, well, not throughout the state, you know, mostly uh, where the stewardship lands are in the north um, to establish that policy. Um, so that's number two. Um, we've engaged a lot with tribes, particularly on the north coast, around um, extending um, electricity um, uh, to uh, at the very top of PG&E's uh, system. Um, where, you know, the system never went to uh, tribal members. And so uh, my uh, former colleague, Commissioner Catherine Sandoval, did a lot of work with PG&E to push them to extend their system. And now, with, with, the, uh, with the new poles and wires extending a little further, that's giving us the opportunity to uh, work with the tribes on broadband grants to get some connectivity onto that infrastructure that was um, uh, uh, placed as a result of Commissioner Sandoval's work. Um, so those are just some examples. Um, so we really do try to um, get out in the, you know, interact with tribes um, on a government to government basis. I had the opportunity to spend time at the Blue Lake Rancheria checking out their microgrid. They have an amazing microgrid system there. Um, that's really provided um, resilience and um, um, sort of a uh, emergency gathering place in that region. Um, I had the opportunity a few months ago to attend the uh, first ever tribal energy summit where, you know, the first day was just the tribes meeting individually and the second day was um, state and local officials and tribes meeting together to talk about, you know, the energy issues. Um, and you know, sort of both opportunities, like in the Blue Lake example, um, and challenges, like in the Yurok example. I mean, you have this this uh, sort of dichotomy of some tribes still trying to get basic service, and other tribes who are industry leaders. So that kind of summarizes what we're doing in that area. Thank you. Yeah. The, st the state boards and myself personally, and. and Incredibly committed to our relationship with our tribal nations, and and do see that as a, a, a sovereign relationship. When I was in Senator Boxer's office, I was fortunate to actually um, handle the Native American portfolio. So met and know all our federally recognized tribes very well. But now at the state boards, because of our um, uh, acknowledgement of all the state recognized tribes as well, have been very fortunate to to be able to to engage with the communities. So we also have a tribal uh, consultation policy. Our Office of Public Participation particularly uh, has ensured that we have tribal liaisons in each of our nine regional water quality control boards. And so we're engaged with uh, tr tribal communities throughout California, whether it's 
up in the Klamath uh, regions, you know, working with the Karuk and also the Hoopa on, on the Klamath River and um, down to the uh, Southern uh, California reaches where, you know, we work with Torres Martinez in the context of the Salton Sea um, or, or other tribes throughout the, the state. So we're, we're very fortunate um, to one, uh, have a very strong culture at the State Water Board acknowledging tribal communities, particularly because when we talk about uh, tribes in the context of water rights, federally recognized tribes have um, you know, when, because of Winter's Doctrine, have federally reserved rights that uh, date back to time immemorial. So when we talk about how do we create certainty in our watersheds and in our communities, um, when you have tribes, uh, federally recognized tribes with uh, federally uh, recognized water rights, resolving and, and, and quantifying those rights is actually a really important thing to do in order to bring certainty to watersheds and bring uh, tribal communities back to the discussion around the, the management of their water resources. Um, and so, um, yeah, really uh, could talk further and glad to because um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a point of passion for myself. So. Excellent. Other add, questions? Can I add, I just want to add two very quick points on tribal, um, just very quickly. Um, the second of the governor's executive orders on um, fire prevention and, and management mentioned um, the role that cultural burning plays, and I think there's just such an emerging um, role for tribes to play in um, fire management, fire prevention, um, with respect to cultural burning. and. In the debris removal process, many of our tribes have come forward as cultural resource monitors. Um, and so that's another area of really critical, um, not just opportunity for us, but um, really critical management of our state's history. Um, and so I just wanted to mention those two areas. Great, thank you. Um, yes, Andrew. Thank you very much for your comments. And thank you for your hard work making on Ms. Garcia's comments uh, regarding uh, the use of Cal Enviro screen uh, to uh, help disadvantaged communities uh, and the prioritization of, of uh, climate investment. Uh, how would you suggest um, you know, uh, incentivizing renewable fuels like we did for solar and wind so that disadvantaged communities that live along the transportation corridors and by ports don't have to wait 10 or more years natural gas trucks now uh, so that they can uh, stay in California, stay in Southern California, and not be forced to move uh, because of their health or because of their of rising utility bills. So this is a question directed specifically to Yana about whether uh, the whether Cal EPA is working to incentivize renewable transportation fuels. Um, so short answer to that reframing of the question is um, yes we're working with our sister agencies to to do so um, I I think I'm understanding your question well but I'm probably not going to address the natural gas issue quite as maybe you're trying to get at so help me to clarify that if, if it's not clear um, but I think the Cal Enviro screen tool can be extraordinarily instructive for um, prioritizing investments for renewable infrastructure, um, for electrification infrastructure. We've seen that um, uh, through uh, proceedings before the Public Utilities Commission um, and citing decisions um, for electrification infrastructure. Um, when it comes to the issue around natural gas, I think there are a number of, of um, uh, uh, arguments, I guess, or, or ways of thinking about um, the role that natural gas can play, I think from um, an immediate um, vulnerability standpoint, particularly for vulnerable rate payers, um, and um, to integrate uh, electricity users to to um, resources. I think natural gas may have a role to play there. I also think the the narrative around um, the use of natural gas as a potentially um, you know, less necessary bridge fuel is certainly valid um, and informs a lot of the conversation around the longer term um, and statewide use of natural gas. But there's no reason um, Cal Enviro Screen, I think, is, is an inappropriate tool um, to use for prioritizing investments of electrification infrastructure. That's the short answer. It's Thank a very you. appropriate tool. So, yes.
how do you implement that, especially in areas that are indicated for the road? So I, 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 the question is about uh, incorporating environmental justice into cities' uh, general plans and I suppose other planning documents within cities and how you can get particularly small and underfunded cities uh, to, uh, you know, to, to be able to, to implement that as a priority. Um, so I think the shortest answer or the, the most effective thing that I've seen in my experience, my limited experience, um, is that funding really makes a huge difference. Like providing a carrot um, makes a really big difference, um, probably in every context you could think of. Um, but the other thing that I think helps a lot is providing technical assistance, even if it's not via um, just a handover of funds. Um, if it's even just providing a, a staff person or two or um, a series of conversations to troubleshoot through some of the issues that will undoubtedly come up when you're updating a general plan. Um, the Office of Planning and Research does a lot of work, of course, with our, with our um, local land use agencies. Um, there's also a lot of conversation around um, the difference in models between a program like the Transformative Climate Communities Program, which does in fact offer this funding carrot, right, um, and implementation of um, something like SB 1000, which doesn't have that funding. Um, I think there's an overlay in terms of lessons learned from the Transformative Climate Communities Program implementation and what can also be done in the context of SB 1000. Um, and I, I hope that at the local level and at the state, we don't overcomplicate what it takes to um, develop an environmental justice element. I think it's, it's difficult because we don't really have um, we have some case study examples, um, but we don't have a, a rubric that anyone in particular is using. Um, but I also think that's like a big opportunity because we can develop what that looks like um, given different contexts. And in, in many ways, that's sort of the spirit of, of what it is we're looking at. Um, the California Environmental Justice Alliance and many of our environmental justice um, advocacy partners have done really incredible work in developing toolkits that are really helpful for um, local land use agencies undertaking the SB 1000 implementation process. Um, the Office of Planning and Research in partnership with many environmental justice organizations is developing a set of case studies um, for what has worked in particular communities and what has not. Um, so I hope that when those come out, those are also helpful. Um, but I think in general, you know, a general planning process is um, difficult to undertake no matter what you're doing. Um, and so adding on this additional layer of doing something that unfortunately historically has not been done um, adds a layer of complexity. However, I will just say that if you are undertaking uh, an update to two or more elements or to your climate update, you probably have some resources to do that. Um, so again, in, in, in the spirit of not sort of overcomplicating what it is um, that is being asked under SB 1000, like really leveraging at the local level those resources that already exist to update the general plan um, is really important. Thank you. Uh, let's see. Um, Okay, so uh, uh, the question I, uh, is uh, what your agencies are doing to encourage and model collaboration, and I take that to mean maybe both interagency collaboration and also other types of, of collaborative efforts. And I, and, uh, I think this will be our last, uh, our last uh, question since we're, uh, we're out of time, but if each of you could uh, talk about that for just a minute and then we can wrap up the panel, that would be great. Um, yeah, we have found um, collaboration is critical kind of in a couple different areas. Um, 
you know, the wildfire area, definitely. I mean, working with CAL FIRE, OES, uh, local governments um, is, you know, absolutely necessary in kind of uh, uh, building these wildfire mitigation plans and understanding what they need, you know, what the metrics, as we were talking about earlier, need to be and how to implement them. But uh, collaboration is also critical to us in our SB 100 work. Um, you know, working with uh, with all the different agencies in in our decarbonization goals. You know, working with the um, Air Resources Board, with the Energy Commission, um, with local governments as much as possible in uh, decarbonizing our economy and and looking at how can we support transportation electrification goals by working with the utilities to ensure that we have the right infrastructure to support the charging um, and in, you know in a myriad of different ways and um, as as Mary mentioned you know local governments are critical to all of this work I mean they have uh, planning roles when it comes to siting transportation uh, infrastructure uh, 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 to increase um, the accessibility to chargers and things like that um, but also things like, you know, what kind of what kind of building codes uh, are you are you going to enforce the uh, Energy Commission's really strong um, new building codes, and also think about what you can do beyond that to encourage um, electrification of appliances. And so, trying to we have a new proceeding to implement. Um, uh, SB 1477 um, to look at building decarbonization and making sure that we are able to work with local governments so that they can give us suggestions and, and we can communicate with them on how to implement that bill is going to be uh, real, really important for us. Thank you. Yeah, in order for us to be successful at all, particularly given the complexity of the, you know, the challenges we face on the regulatory or we're trying to address through on, on the regulatory side on water, um, require us to have collaboration early and often, particularly as we scope out what it is that we're trying to set out to do. And you know, whether it's a, setting a maximum contaminant limit on drinking water or uh, total daily maximum load in a watershed, um, you know, it, it does require uh, a tremendous amount of, of collaboration generally. And but the resources to do it as well. And that goes back to my, my previous point about being a fee-based organization where it requires you to then have the staff and personnel to collaborate with uh, and not just write the permit or write the policy, but you know, do take the time and have the resources to engage with the broad scope of constituencies that are required, particularly, you know, our, our chief deputy, Jonathan Bishop, says he apologizes to a lot of our, our new staff coming in on the water quality side because you know, through the course of the last decades, because of Porter Cologne and the Clean Water Act, we've been able to address all the really easy stuff. And what's left is the more complicated non-point source pollution challenges and this you know, general soup that we find ourselves with when we talk about water quality in the natural environment. And so um, you know, we, it, it is part of who we are. And, and you know, our history as uh, you know, our, our, at first being lo local pollution control boards through the Dickey Act in the 40s, um, you know, we have, uh, because of it in its artifact, we have our nine regional water quality control boards, which uh, themselves are seven board members each. Uh, so we have 63 uh, governor appointed uh, positions. And you know, I say that because that local leadership, that dispersed leadership is supposed to be leveraged. It's supposed to be people from the communities that are members of these, uh, uh, of the regional water quality control boards. And I think that we can do better to actually continue to leverage then that expertise. And you know, there's always a natural tension between our regional boards and the state board. And it's a similar tension I think some of our other agencies feel um, in, in the, the complexity of the way that we, we've chosen to regulate some of these things, but that are supposed to be there for benefit. And that is that you get to have given the, the size of our state, given the complexity and the geographic specificness of the challenges that we face around, say, you know, water, you need it, you need that local collaboration, that local perspective in order to be effective. Um, and, you know, I, it's something that I'm always uh, continuing fo continue to foca focus on and see as really a core strength of the state boards generally, given our very public process oriented um, uh, uh, design. Thank you. Um, I'd say that for for me, I know we all have um, 
the responsibility and privilege of really working on behalf of all Californians. Um, for my role in particular, collaboration and really deeply meaningful partnership is critical. Um, and by that I mean uh, partnerships specifically with historically disenfranchised communities across our state um, and the very communities that are disproportionately burdened to environmental pollution um, and the health burdens that stem from that. Um, I, can, I can't do much of anything without um, partnership with them um, and with organizations that represent those communities, um, as well as our, our tribes, our California uh, Native American tribes across our state. Um, they're a critical touch point. Um, in the absence of um, really clear metrics, often um, that is the, the metric, you know, um, whether something is working or not. Um, based on the perspective of folks on the ground, um, whether things can be improved and how, and what the most pressing issues are, and what some of the unintended consequences might be of um, much of the work that we're doing that we may very well think is excellent and, and going to solve a, a serious environmental challenge, but that might come with um, unintended consequences that we might not otherwise perceive. So it's critical to what I do. Well, thank you. So we'll be reconvening at 12.45, um, and uh, we're going to break for lunch. There's lunch waiting for everybody outside. I want to thank our panelists for a wonderful panel. <laughs>